John chapter number 12, I'd like to begin reading in verse number 9. Much people of the Jews, therefore, knew that he was there. And they came not to see Jesus' sake only, for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus also, who he raised from the dead. This is in the town of Bethany. He had just raised Lazarus from the dead, and now the whole city has turned out to see him. But the chief priest consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death. We're living in a bad society when they'd rather have people dead than alive. They'd rather Lazarus been in the tomb and his family suffering than to be together and to be happy. Because that by reason of him, Lazarus, many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. On the next day, this is the day of what we call the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. On the next day, much people that were come to the feast that was at Jerusalem during that time, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, which is about a 12-mile journey from Bethany. When Jesus got there, here's what the Bible said. They took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him. And they cried. They didn't say it. They yelled it. Hosanna! Blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. Thank you for reading that scripture with me today. Word has spread throughout Jerusalem that Jesus is about to enter the city. Testimonies of his power to heal and restore has echoed off the city walls for days now. Many were about to see Jesus for the first time. So because of that, families and leaders and those with great influence lined the cobblestone streets waiting for their first glimpse of this Jesus of Nazareth. Women began to dance. The air was filled with excitement. Men were holding their little children on their shoulders as families were putting young people in front of the crowded lines where everyone could witness the sight of this Jesus and his appearing. While the anticipation was growing moment by moment, somebody introduced the thought of offering a palm branch as a tribute of honor and worship to this king. Soon the whole multitude uh, was overshadowed with numerous amounts of palm branches being held by people young and old alike. As Jesus entered the beautiful gate, you must realize how majestic it was. The beautiful gate is 75 feet high and 60 feet wide. The gate swing open and in comes the lonely Nazarene sitting on a colt's ass. People had given their garments to cover the back of the colt to make his ride more soothing to him. And as they came in to enjoy all the festivities, uh, they were beginning to sing and shout. And some of them even took their palm leaves and branches and threw them down on the dusty road, offering a smoother ride to Jesus as he came inside the city. But eventually all the branches found their way to the ground as the festivities went on in time. Little did anyone know at that time but the very same people that shouted and cried and danced and sang would be standing on those same branches. But they will be darkened branches now. And instead of yelling, Hosanna, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord, those same people are going to be yelling, let his blood be upon us and our children as Jesus was now to be crucified. What was it that led such a triumphal entry is what we call it? How could something triumphant and so beautiful and so exciting and so energetic turn bad so fast? That in just a couple of days they went from shouting to screaming. They went from calling him king to calling him a deceiver. They went from calling him God to being a false prophet. How could something change that fast? When Jesus is coming into Jerusalem... For the last time. Well, one thing that crossed my mind is I begin to study his footsteps once he entered into Jerusalem. This is what made them change their mind. You understand, Hosanna means save us. It's an attitude of praise because you've been delivered, because you've been saved. So when Jesus rode in on that colt's ass that day, the Jewish people had their worship. Palm branches is a type of worship. And they were waving their worship saying, save us. They wanted to be saved from the Roman government 
that was putting persecution and pressure on them. See, they wanted Jesus to deal with governmental problems. They wanted Jesus to deal with criminal problems. But here's what changed their mind about Jesus. On the Sabbath day, he walked in the temple and saw them selling turtles and doves. And the same crowd that shouted when he came in, the same crowd that took him on for monthly support, the same crowd that said, that's what we need, a Republican leader, the same crowd that says, we need reformation in our justice system. They loved Jesus then, but when he walked in the church and said, not only is the government full of hell, not only is the justice system full of hell, but the church is full of hell. I'm losing some of you already. Better clap while you can. It's going to get worse. Oh, they wanted Jesus to flip the tables at the courthouse. They wanted Jesus to flip the tables at the White House. But they didn't want him messing with what was going on at the church house. And Jesus walked in and saw them selling all of their offerings. And the Bible said he sat down and took a piece of leather and made a cat of nine tails or a whip and was sitting there watching them. No doubt that crowd saw him making that whip. They said, I'll tell you what he's going to do. He's going to whoop Herod with that thing. I'll tell you what he's going to do. He's going to whoop these little uh, liberal judges with that thing. But instead, he stood up, flipped all the money tables, and here's what your Bible said. He took a whip and drove them out of the temple. Which means if they didn't go on their own, he gave them some assistance. Which means there's sometimes you need your butt busted. I'm going to preach on that sometime. When you need your butt busted. And Jesus said, you're a hypocrite to want me to keep the government clean, keep the judicial system clean, and then let the church be corrupt. I've learned a long time ago, there's a lot of church people like that still today. They love when I preach against Joe Biden. They like when I preach against the liberal Supreme Court judges. But when I start flipping tables of the hell going on in the church, all of a sudden, all of those that used to shout for me, now they turn against me. So if you keep your crap off the table, I don't have to flip it. But if you're dumb enough to put it on the table in this church, I'm strong enough to flip it and tell you, get right or get out. So that's what happened. Now all of a sudden, this crowd's mad at Jesus. Ain't no palm branches waving now, brother. All the worship is gone, palm branches type of worship. There ain't a palm branch one in sight now. Because the devil knows one thing. If he can get your worship, he's got you. Worship is so important. And I know people talk about, well, I worship different. I do it in my heart. I cry, I shout, I whistle, I clap, I run. I don't care what you do. I just know you need to worship. Let me tell you how important worship was in the Old Testament. I was studying it this week. And I've studied palm trees, and I'm sick of it, by the way. But did you know when Solomon built that temple, brother, and he brought in the wood of Lebanon and it outlined the post of the tabernacle and the temple inside, did you know engraved in that beautiful wood from Lebanon, all across the top and the bottom were palm branches engraved in that wood? Because it reminded everybody, no matter what your personality is, no matter what color you are, and no matter what age you are, when you come into the house of God, you ought to have one thing on your mind, and that is to give worship and praise and adoration to the one that's worthy of it. That's what your Bible, your Bible says that, by the way. So the devil knows how important it is to stay in tune with God and not let anything hinder you or rob you of your worship. You remember when Jesus was on the Mount of Temptation. You remember how he tempted the Lord, first to turn the bread, uh, the stone in the bread, and then to cast himself and let the angels save him off the cliff. But then he said this, why don't you bow down and worship me, and I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. That was really where he was headed in the first place, Brother Jones, because he knew if he could get Jesus to worship him, it would ruin him and destroy him, and it would annul the sacrifice he had brought to bring. And Jesus looked at him and said, let me tell you something about worship. You're to worship God and God alone. 
I'm not bowing down to anybody. I'm not worshiping anybody else. And by the way, devil, I'm not letting you steal my worship from me. Some of you need to tell the devil this morning, you're not going to let him take your worship from you. Has the devil withered your palm branch? I want to preach for a few minutes this morning, probably the unusual setting of an Easter service we've ever been in. I want to preach on the warning against withered worship. The warning against withered worship. Here's what your Bible says about it. Psalms chapter 100 and verse 4. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving. That's what the Bible says. And enter into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him. And bless his name. That's not an option. That's a commandment from the Bible. Some of you ain't never said amen in your life. Some of you women ain't never cried unless you're cutting onions for a hot dog sale. But I'm telling you, if you've been born again, you're obligated to bless his name, to be thankful unto him, and to give him glory for all the good things he's done in our life. That's a commandment of the Lord. So I want to talk to you for just a few minutes today. Where's it at, Miss Kid? Where's it at over here? Here we go. I want to talk about... This thing looks bad, but it's a Baptist palm branch. <laughs> Some things about it that are not Baptist. Number one, it's skinny. Number two, there's three leaves and they're all in one accord. That's not a Baptist palm branch. So they were waving these things before the Lord. This is a type of worship. We did this for 4,000 years in the New Old Testament. Surely we can worship. You know what the devil would like to do? He'd like to see that wither up and dry up and die on you. The older we get in Jesus, the more fruitful and expanded our worship could be and should be. So I studied palm trees this week. So I want to give you three quick points about your worship. I want you to notice the world of a palm tree, the war of a palm tree, and the warning to the palm tree. Number one, what, is, what does it take to have a branch grow like this on a on a palm tree there's three necessities that you must have in order to have a palm tree grow a branch of such sort these three three things are also mandatory to be in our lives if we're going to produce worship if you've never enjoyed the Lord and worshiped him it's probably because something here that I'm going to mention is not prevalent in your life three things I studied that that you got to have to have to have a branch of worship number one it takes sunlight did you know a palm tree has an inner desire to be in direct sunlight. There are hormones in male, and by the way, there's male and female palm trees. Even trees know there's only two genders, by the way. That's God, you're dumber than a palm tree if you don't know what you are. A palm tree knows it's, it's a male or a female. But a palm tree has hormones in it. <laughs> don't, you all right? Up, up. <laughs> My security choking down on me over here. A palm tree has hormones in it. And in that liquid mixed with the hormones that run up and down the trunk of that tree, from the time it breaks the dirt till the day it dies, those hormones long to be in direct sunlight. A palm tree don't want anything getting between it and the sun. It doesn't want to be shaded. It doesn't want to be covered. It doesn't want to be in the shadows. It doesn't want to be on the sidelines. It knows if it's going to grow and be like it should be. If it's going to produce branches of worship that gives God glory. It can't let anything get between it and the sunlight. Are you all listening to me now? Could it be the reason why a lot of people don't worship God is you've let something get between you and the sun. You're kind of in the shadows. You're kind of in the dark. You're kind of off on the sideline. You're kind of off the beaten trail. You've kind of got off at an exit. And you're not really where you need to be. And you wonder why worship has evaporated out of your life. i tell you why. You've let something get between you and your God. That's why. Now, I have a lot to cover, so I can't afford to get bogged down. But I passed by the baseball fields this morning. Sunday morning, baseball fields are packed. I'm talking kids that high playing baseball. 
You know what they're teaching their kids from a very young age? There's something more important than the sun. Sports is more important than the sun. Now, I'm going to tell you, you better listen to me well. I'm not against sports. You play sports, that's fine. I'm not against anything until it gets between you and the sun. Anything that gets between you and God, you better mark it down. It has one purpose, to rob you of your ability to worship in spirit and in truth. Just don't let anything get between you and God. It's got to have sunlight. Second of all, in the world of a palm tree, the wind has to blow. I didn't know this until I got to studying it. But did you know when the wind blows, the palm tree relies on the wind to blow while it's young so that it'll be strong when it grows up. The palm tree wants to be out in the open. He doesn't have to be surrounded by other palm trees to stand. From his birth, he wants to stand by himself. And when the storms blow, he doesn't let it blow him out and blow him over. He lets the storm make him stronger at the base so that he can grow and not be affected later on in life. See, when God sends things our way that we don't like, it's not to push us over or destroy us. It's to make us strong now so we can develop to our full potential as we mature and grow in the grace and the admonition of our Lord. Let me tell you something else I learned about the wind. The reason why palm trees, I was looking the other day, they live to be over 100 years old. 100 years old. How does a tree live to be 100 years old? By the way, the roots of a palm tree only go less than 36 inches in the ground. And they only expand less than 36 inches wide. So when the storms come, they're down in Florida, they're all over the coast. You ever watch those, those newscasters in Florida? Them idiots are standing out there in 80 mile an hour winds, cars are flipping over behind them. Yeah, it's raining out here. Yeah, I think it is, brother. Get your tail out of the storm. You got cars flipping down the road, you got houses going off in the water, and all of a sudden out in the middle of this horrible storm stands a palm tree. You know why a palm tree can stand the storms? You know why they live to be so old? Not only because they want to be in direct sunlight, but they learn to bend to the wind. They bend to the direction of the wind. You watch a palm tree when the wind blows. Most trees, here's what they do. They stand up, the wind blows, they fall. But you know what a palm tree does? The wind starts blowing, and this is what it'll do. It's learned that if you yield to the wind, it won't destroy you. It'll develop you. And you know what? That's what happens when you're a spirit-filled Christian. When the Holy Ghost gets to blowing, the way you mature and the way you grow and the way you keep from falling over is you learn to yield to the wind. You understand me now? When the wind blows, if you'll yield to the wind, it won't knock you down. It'll build you up. The palm branch has got to have the sun. It's got to have the wind. Now watch this. I didn't know this now. I'm going to be honest. I didn't know this. There are male and female palm trees. And they have babies. Now you figure that out. They have babies. There are no neutral gender trees. There are no transgender trees. <laughs> you, you, you cannot make a male tree into a female tree. You cannot make a female into a male tree but they want to reproduce. They want worship to grow out everywhere. So here's what God does. God puts pollen on the male. And that pollen lays stagnant on that palm tree. It doesn't go anywhere. There's no seedlings, there's no birth, there's no new trees, unless the wind blows. The male does not have the ability to get to the female to reproduce. All he can do is put up the pollen, which is an opportunity. And he waits. And when the wind blows, it takes that pollen out across that, or across that field and latches onto that female. That female begins to produce seedlings. They're a couple inches long, hundreds and thousands of them. And the seedlings are sweet and they fall off to the ground. And on their own, they'll die. But God put it in the heart of birds to love those seeds. Those birds go down there and eat the seeds. Listen to this. It's one of the few tree seeds that birds eat that the digestive system doesn't kill it. So when the seed goes through, I can go deep on this, but it's, when the seed goes through the bird, it not only comes out, but it comes out mixed with fertilizer. 
Don't tell me there ain't a God in heaven. Comes out with fertilizer. And the bird goes off in another direction, drops that seed, and without the help of any other palm tree, from out of nowhere, a little seed begins to come up. Another tree begins to come up. You know why there was a new birth? Because the wind was blowing. That's why there was a new birth. I'm going to tell you why I'm going to raise hell about anything grieving the Holy Ghost in this church. Because when the wind quits blowing, people are going to quit getting saved. Lives are going to quit being changed. And I'm not putting up with that with you or me or anybody else. If you're stopping the wind, you got to go. Something else, a palm tree. Are y'all staying with me? It's got to have water. Palm tree soil must always be moist. If, uh, if the soil gets hard, it affects and stuns the growth of the tree. In other words, you've got to stay tender. Its branches reach out. Here's another thing. The bottom section of the branches of the palm tree, they reach outward to give a shadow to the roots so that it stays moist and it doesn't get hard. See, our worship should not only go up, but it should also go out to keep our hearts tender and soft and we don't let anything let us get hard on the Lord. The branches read out, reach out to, shade, to save it. And the reaction of proper watering is that tree can grow to be 80 feet tall. You would not believe how much you could grow in Jesus if you would have a steady diet of his word. We are clean through his word. You know why you, your growth is stunt? You know why you can't shout? You know why you don't have any palm branches in your life? You don't ever get in his word. You got hard. You get callous. You get dried out. You got to be in direct sunlight. You got to let the Holy Ghost bend you like he wants to. Then you got to keep your nose in that book. And I tell you what, if you keep God first, yield to the Holy Ghost and read his word, you'll have worship. So, that's the world of a palm branch. Number two, I must go quickly. I want you to notice the war against palm branches. There's three things that kill a, a palm tree. This one doesn't shock me at all. Number one is people. One of the most harmful enemies to the palm tree and its branches are being pulled on. When you pull on it, it becomes a frond, F-R-O-N-D. And when you pull on the frond, you not only kill it, which is the worship, but listen to this, it turns it to poison. When a palm branch is pulled on, when it's governed in the wrong direction, when it's being pulled on the wrong way, what used to be worship now turns into poison. Don't let your worship become poisoned by somebody that's trying to pull on you the wrong way. That's all right. I preach whether I get claps or not. Don't matter to me. You know, it's amazing. Uh, we had a family leave here last week or a couple weeks ago. And a woman wrote one of the women in the church and said, uh, give me a call. I'd like to tell you why we left. I don't want to do it texting. Well, they're probably listening. So let me say this to you. Why don't you call me? If you've got a problem with this church, why don't you call me? I'll tell you why you want to call somebody else. You want to pull them in the wrong direction so they wither away and lose all their worship and they become hateful and wicked and bitter and ungodly just like they are. That's what they're trying to do. You got a problem with a preacher, you call me. And if somebody writes you or texts you and says that, the best thing you can do is send it to me and let me take care of it. And that stops all this other mess. I've seen a lot of people die out of church, lose their walk with God, become bitter and mean and hateful. And many of them not even go to church anymore because they let somebody pull them in the wrong direction. I am the problem solver. The buck stops here. You got a problem, I'm man enough to meet you anywhere, anytime, under any circumstance. Trust me, I'm not afraid of you. But I tell you what I'm not going to let you do. I'm not going to let you sit here and pull people in the wrong direction. <laughs> yeah, I know you're watching. Tell your wife I said so. People can pull you in the wrong direction and cost you your worship. Number two, insects. There's one insect that invades a palm tree. It's called the red weevil. It goes after the crown of the tree. It only eats the glory of the tree. Only the crown of it. It starts off small and hidden, but that little weevil 
lays three to 500 eggs at a time. And by the way, I had to throw this in. It's the only weeble in the world with a snout. <laughs> Study it out. Don't look at me like that. I'm preaching. It's the only weevil in the world that has a snout, which means it loves to put its nose. <laughs> it enjoys putting its nose in somebody else's business. And though it may look fun to let somebody put their nose in everybody else's business, what the weevil doesn't tell you is it's eating holes in the branch the whole time. It starts off small, microscopic, you can't see it. Before long, the whole branch turns brown and yellow, and it falls off and it dies. See, that's how sin is. It starts off private, it starts off small, it starts off stupid, it starts off secret. But remember this about sin, it never ends up that way. What you are doing in private, God will reveal in public. The Holy Ghost will reveal what you really are. And when the Spirit of God gets on me that there's a problem, you better believe as a watchman of this church, I'm hitting this pulpit wide open with everything I got because I don't want your stinking snout to, <laughs> to ruin this church. Another way the worship dies is you get disconnected through the storms of life. The tree recognizes that the front is dying off. And here's what the tree, which is the type of the church, here's what the tree does. When it sees a branch dying off, it doesn't start crying and weeping. It begins producing a new one to take its place so that when it does die off, a new, healthier, stronger branch takes its place. See, some people are naive enough to think that they have so much control over a church that if they leave, the church goes under. But long before you left, God knew you were going to leave. And he's already prepared somebody better, younger, and stronger. God does not need you. He does not need me. He can replace all of us with somebody that would probably do a better job than we're doing right now. So, let me hurry up and say this. When the branch points to the earth and not to the sun, it's dying. So, in our worship, we're either looking to him or we're looking to the world. See, a, a branch can't look up and down at the same time. So which way are you looking? Are you looking for the Lord and the positive things of God and the leadership of the Holy Ghost and the desire of His Word and grow to maturity? Or are you so eat up in the world that you have no worship in your life at all? I see people come in our services that are totally out the top and they're playing with their fingernails in the house of God. I wonder why you look at worldly things when we're enjoying spiritual things. It's because you're spiritually dried up and dying and you're going the wrong direction with your life. Number three, I got to close. The warning to all of us with palm branches. If you're not careful, it can change your attitude about good stuff. So Jesus comes in, he's the son of God. They all admitted that put it on the saying on top of the cross. This is Jesus, king of the Jews. So that was settled by a Gentile, by the way, Herod and Pilate. So here's Jesus, king of the Jews. He's God manifested in the flesh, right? This is God in a body of flesh. And they're saying, you are the king. You are God. You are the Savior. We are worshiping and having a ball. But because they let something affect their worship, that same crowd that believed that are now saying this. Not only do we want his blood on us, put the king's blood on us, put the judgment on us. Well, watch what they said. Put it on our children. They despise him so bad, they said, we don't even want our children to be identified with such a man that would defile the temple by cleaning it out. And not only can you bring you into a place and an attitude that you never dreamed you could ever have. Talking to a 15-year-old boy some time ago, he slammed his hand on the table and said, I hate God, I can't wait to get to hell, and I want to spit in his face on Judgment Day. Preacher's kid, 15-year-old. I grabbed his hand, I said, son, what can turn a preacher's kid that used to sing in the choir, work in the youth, now you hate God, you want to go to hell, and you're spitting in his face. How can you do that? He said, I'll tell you why. My mama loved God and loved the Bible. 
We anointed her with oil. We prayed. My mama got cancer, and I watched her go down to a bedpan and 70 pounds. And if there was a God in heaven, he would have healed my mama. And because he misunderstood the plan of God, it's now turned his love into bitterness and hatred. See, sometimes if we're not careful, God does things in our life we're uncomfortable with and we can't explain. But, if, but see, God sees the big picture. You've got to trust him. You may not be able to trace him, but you can always trust him. So when God lets things come our way, and we say, well, I don't know why God let that happen. You've got to understand there's a purpose in the long run. But if you don't understand that and accept it with the right spirit, you can become hateful and bitter at the very things you used to love. Even the very people you used to love. It'll not only change your attitude, but it'll curse your children. That statement was so strong, Jesus must have heard it in the judgment hall as they filled the streets again, standing on their palm branches. All their worship is dead. All their worship is gone. All their worship is turned brown. All their worship is now poisonous. And they're yelling, put his blood on our kids. Jesus must have heard that. Because in Luke 23, when he's walking up the hill carrying his cross, the Bible said the women followed him weeping. And Jesus stopped and turned around and said this, women of, is, women of Jerusalem, don't weep for me. Weep for your children. Because you've allowed your worship to be poisoned, and I'm not only going to curse you, but I'm going to curse your children. You know why I never quit on God? You know why I never wanted to get bitter? You know why I never wanted to fall out with things of God? Because I didn't want to bring the curse of God on my children. I didn't want my kids to grow up to be mean and unfaithful and ungodly because they saw it in their daddy. Sometimes people walk away that know better. I've watched this. My wife will bear witness with this. I went to Bible college with a fellow, a good guy. He quit Bible college, went back home and... Uh, took a church. Wasn't long after that, he had a moral situation that disqualified him from pastoring. So he left the ministry, got back with his wife, and was trying to patch things up. But see, this guy had been filled with the Holy Ghost. He had been called to preach. He had been anointed. And he'd walked away for the flesh. Knowing better, right? He that do good and doeth not to him in his sin. For years, he would come to my meeting every year. Every year. He would come to my meeting with his wife and family. When we stood for the invitation, he was the first one, bam, down that aisle. Tears streaming down his face. Oh, brother, kid, get me back to God. More than I want to live, I want to get back to God. Every year, brother Joe, get me back to God. I'd come out of the pulpit area and put my arm around him and Lord, we sat in Bible college together. He wouldn't last a week. I'd call the pastor the week after the meeting. Hey, how's so-and-so doing? He's out. He's out! Let me tell you why he tries getting in, but he falls back out and he tries getting in. Let me tell you why. Because there was a level he had been with God for servitude, for surrender, for being serious. There was a level of fellowship and anointing and, and walking with God that he had enjoyed. But because he turned away for selfish reasons, it's not that you can't come back. That's not true. God is a God of a second chance. But while you're out, you have forfeited levels with God that you're not going to get back. Because the palm tree, once you fall off, it heals itself and goes on without you. When you try to graft a dead branch back into the tree, the branch will die. So I'm saying to you with all fear and trembling, the Bible calls it. If you're right with God and you know the Bible, you better be careful about letting anything rob you of that situation. Because I'm not saying you can't come back. This church is filled with people with second chances. I'm not implying that at all. But I'm saying there are some levels. What he wanted was it to be just like it was before he messed up. It's not going to be that way. You will be reminded of your carnality and your decision the rest of your life because you have forfeited a height that you're not going to get back again. Now, that's not popular preaching. Preachers are afraid to preach this because they're afraid to hurt their people. I'm preaching it because I want you to be everything 
you can possibly be. Now, on a positive note in closing, I read this. When a tree branch falls off at first, immediately when it realizes worship is being cut off, they said that the gardener can take that branch, hold it back up to the tree. He doesn't graft it. Grafting doesn't work. It's called splicing. See, grafting just puts the bark up against the bark. But splicing cuts into the tree and gets that fluid and those hormones and connects it back to that branch. And it's got to be done pretty quick. And because the livelihood of that tree can still get in that branch, that branch can be spliced back in. He can be what he used to be. He can grow like everybody else. He can get back out in the sun. He can start enjoying the wind. He can let the water start flowing through him again. So you know the good news for a child of God is this. Any time and every time you feel like the devil's trying to take your worship, don't, don't, don't let him make you fall to the ground. You let the Holy Ghost splice you right back in. You get right back into the heart of God. You let the... You let that flow start flowing through you again. That's why we have altars. That's why we repent. So that when we mess up, we can find our place back to God, get spliced back in, and grow, and grow, and be everything God ever wanted us to be. Let's give the Lord a hand in His house.